I have a lot of guys reaching out to me now who are like, hey, will you mentor me? Will you teach me? And they are the guys who are going viral. And I'm like, why would you, you know, want me? You have 3 million, you know, followers. And they're like, and they tell me, we don't, I don't really even know the word. I'm just regurgitating stuff I see online. And I don't even have wow. a real spiritual life. Today on the Church Candy Podcast, we're sitting down with Pastor Mike Signorelli from V1 Church. He has built a huge following on social media, and we break down how pastors and churches can utilize social media to spread the word and grow their church. Now, before we jump in, I just want to ask you a quick favor to please like and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching on YouTube, or leave us a review and follow us on iTunes tunes or spotify if that's where you're listening it really helps the church candy podcast out helps us reach more people helps us reach more churches to spread the word and now let's go ahead and just jump right into the episode welcome to the church candy podcast the podcast of sweet ministry success i'm your host brady sticker and let's jump in Pastor Mike, how are you doing today, man? I'm here in New York City, and it used to be warm, but not today. So I got some coffee, and I'm ready to rock and roll. <laughs> See, this must be the time of year in New York where it fluctuates pretty much. I love I love the city. We visit there every couple of years or so, and it's really nice. What part of New York, because uh, I know you guys have campuses kind of all throughout that area. Where, where are you based out of? Yeah. Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which is okay. home of the, the home of Hipsterville, USA. Uh, anything and everything cool comes out of Williamsburg. Used to be the hood, but it gentrified. So uh, we're you know we're dealing with that. But um, I not and then I live in Queens, so we've you know okay. we're home of Spider Man. So <laughs> and so I've got this incredible view of Manhattan from where I live and. It's amazing. I'm obsessed with New York City ever since Ninja Turtles, uh, you know, and Master Splinter as a kid <laughs> and Home yeah. Alone, too. So right. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm originally from Indiana. And when I came out to New York City, I just fell in love and never left. And people hate it here. Matter of fact, it's really hard to get guests like uh, to want to speak at our church even good friends of mine because they're like, man, I hate New York City. I, I it's su it's such a hassle. But I think there's a grace on my life for it. So, you know, where sin abounds, grace is greater. There's a lot of sin here, so there's a lot of grace. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, look, man, uh, the reason I wanted to reach out and have you on the pod, I know that we've been working with V1 Church, and you guys are killing it, but I get asked all the time from pastors, you know, what what can I be doing on social media to, to reach more people just on the organic posting side of things. And I know you and not just V1 Church, but just Mike Signorelli Ministries in general, you're always creating a lot of content. So uh, I'd love to kind of just talk through that. And how, how did you get started creating content for Christians on social media? Well, yeah, I'm going to start by offending all of the pastors into their next level because I'm going to say what they don't want me to say. And I'm also going to say what your staff wants to tell you, but you're not listening, is avoiding the Internet is not an option in this era. And you, whether you love it, whether you hate it, whether you're annoyed by it, it, you have to be online. You have to. Matter of fact, I think the worst preachers are the ones who create the most content, I think that the best preachers in America are creating the least amount of content because they're good preachers. So while I'm I'm giving you two slaps and a hug, it's like you have to get over yourself. You you have, stop being a boomer. You know that's what the youth call us boomers, and you have to start creating online because I'm sick and tired of people who don't understand theology and doctrine who but do understand the algorithm creating content and essentially we're in an, an, an era right now where the worst preaching is the is what we have online so uh, to all of you listening right now who are the best preachers in america that nobody's ever heard of get over yourself and here's the thing they're going to say i can't find anybody to edit go to fiverr go to uh, you know upwork go like you yes you can you know and so i think we need to get over our excuses and the reason why i say that is because I was you. I was the pastor who said, I'm a real preacher. I'm not going to waste my time with this internet stuff. It's vanity metrics. It's stupid. I don't care about likes. I don't care about influence. I don't care about... And my wife was the one who was like, Mike, that you can't talk that way because there's people who will never come to our church who will scroll past your stuff online. And if you believe in soul winning, 
you need to believe in internet marketing and internet and reaching people online. And my wife kept challenging me and I'd say, well, I'm an introvert. And you know, Acts chapter one, verse eight happened to me when I was 15 years old and the Holy Spirit came upon me and I received a boldness to preach, but I don't want to be a cringy influencer. You know, I don't want to be the guys like, hey, hey, everybody, you know, and, and, and my wife was like, you need to get over yourself. That's a form of pride. That's false humility. You, if you have boldness to preach in an auditorium, you have boldness to preach on a camera and and go online and that's false humility and that's another form of pride and my wife just kept be basically beating me up until the pandemic hit and now i'm in new york city we are a multi-site national church that hit fastest growing church in america for two years in a row two or three before the pandemic hit and and i i don't own any of our buildings in new york city if you guys want to donate and help me buy a building you can but uh you know i i was checkmated and I had to minister online. And if it wasn't for that situation, I started going viral every day. And what people were saying was, how did I never hear about you before? And it's like, well, because I was stuck on stupid and wouldn't listen to my wife and kept, I kept bashing the internet for years being like, you know, it's cringy, it's whatever. And so really the pandemic for me was forced me into this, but now I fully embraced it. And here's what I learned, Brady, is that now the internet has become the top of funnel, which means they see us first online and then they show up in person. And so the new invitation is not word of mouth. The new invitation is phone in hand. And so it's like, you know, what, what's your, what's your phone in hand, uh, you know, ratio, like how many people are seeing you in their feeds and then coming to your, your church services. That is the new school word of mouth. And um, since then, we've launched six more campuses <laughs> and, uh, you know, continue to thrive. And I really attribute that next level to God just sovereignly forcing me into this. So hopefully I just offended somebody into at least trying now and getting over themselves and yeah. joining me into this crazy journey. Yeah. Yeah. I want to touch on something you said there is it's a sense of pride whenever you're set. Essentially, people are not utilizing social media in their ministries i've heard a lot of pastors say almost the opposite of they feel prideful whenever it's always them making content uh and flooding their feeds of just preaching clips and them talking into a camera what do you have to say to that how do you overcome that objection yeah here's here's what i would say to them do you love the people that you're serving and if the answer to that is yes then feed them so it's like you don't eat once a week. You eat seven times a week. You, matter of fact, you eat like 20, 28 times or more a week. And so feed your people 28 times a week. Sometimes when you eat a meal that's too big to eat in one sitting, you make leftovers and you put it in your refrigerator and you heat it up the next day. Your sermon might be uh, anywhere between 30 to 60 minutes and it's too much for them to feast on in one setting. Cut it up into leftovers and feed it to them all week if you're a good spiritual father and a good pastor and a good shepherd. The other thing is they don't understand the way the algorithm works. And so on every social media platform, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, it's going to show people what they interact with. So if you, if it doesn't mean, so followers are a little less relevant than they used to be. Meaning if you're putting out like two preaching clips a day and people from your church who follow you don't want to watch it, they won't. And then the algorithm will stop showing it to them. And it, it, that's how it works. So you literally can't annoy people on social media anymore. But if they do watch it, it's because they want to watch it. And then the next time you post something, they'll see it. So it's this incredible experience where you get to be present. You get to over deliver value. You get to feed the sheep like Christ commanded you to. And then if they don't want to see it, the, the algorithm will figure that out and stop showing it to them. And then they'll, you, they'll see you on Sunday. So no matter how you cut it up, there's, you have to minister to people online nowadays, and you have to be a constant threat in their life. The other thing is church attendance is not weekly anymore. And as church attendance begins to shift and morph into, we're moving away from the concept of attendance and we're shifting into engagement. So what that might mean is like they're engaging with you three and four and five times a month, and then they're physically attending once a month, and you add that all together, but then they have you on reoccurring giving. And a lot of pastors, this is anecdotal. I haven't done like a, a, a you know, ex I haven't done an official 
research project on this, but I talk to many pastors because I serve as oversight for many churches across the country. And what they're saying is people are signed up for reoccurring giving, but they're not signed up for reoccurring attendance. So it's like a weird phenomenon where they're, you know, the Bible says where your treasure is, your heart is also. So their heart is in your house, just not their butt. And so it's like, I think we're living in this weird phenomenon where it's like people are signed up for reoccurring giving. A lot of pastors are telling me, my my budget went up since the pandemic. You know, people are engaged financially, even if they're not engaged physically. But then that means you have to be engaged digitally because I would argue you're reinforcing their commitment to your house even financially. So it's like, to me, this is all how we continue to achieve fastest growing church in America as deemed by Enjoy, by the way, this is not my, and so Enjoy, they, their metric for attendance partly is finances over time. So they're like, here's, here's the annual. And then what they look at is the giving units over time. Then they look at that over years and they see, are you graduating people in, in giving year over year, which to them is an anecdotal formula for discipleship. Because yeah. if you're actively discipling somebody, they increase in their giving. And so what they told me about V1 Church is that we have a backdoor, which means percentage of people leaving our church as small as a 30-year-old established church, which is insane. So people are not leaving our church, and then they're graduating giving year over year, which is an indicator of discipleship. But then we have a front door that's as wide open as fastest growing church in America. And when they asked me, how am I doing that? I told them, I am ruthlessly deploying every digital system that yeah. ubiquitous digital system on the planet right now because it's like if you won't come in person you'll come in zoom if you won't come for zoom you'll you'll be on youtube if you if you don't use youtube i'll find you on facebook if you don't find facebook instagram and it's just showing up in their life over and over and over and over again and the higher the engagement the higher the finances the higher attendance it's all converging and we're literally, literally living like and the last thing i'll say towards this is like paul it used a technology called papyrus. You know, it was like, I have to get a message to people and I'm not going to make an excuse for not physically being with them. And yeah. I'm going to use a technology. If Paul was alive today, he would be on every social media platform. I love it, bro. I love it. One of the things you said was, and I've heard similar analogies before about getting fed, right? And about how your Sunday sermon might be 30 minutes to an hour and then basically batching leftovers throughout the week. I love that. I love that concept. Before we hit record, we were kind of talking through a lot of pastors will spend hours and hours prepping their Sunday message just for it to maybe be streamed to Facebook and YouTube and then sit on the archive and never be touched again. And poof, it's gone. Hardly any views, anything like that. So I, I, I'm very big on encouraging churches and pastors to repurpose their content, meaning repackage their Sunday sermons on their social media. So what are different ways that you have implemented that? Yeah, I would say, you know, find people who represent different demographic demographics and then have them tell you what the preaching clips should be. So there's volunteers in your church, older folks, there's Gen Z, there's middle-aged folks, there's, you know, uh, younger millennials, there's people from every slice of the pie that if you say, hey, would you, no, I learned this from Tim Keller. I know that, I don't know how many of you are listening from maybe the Reformed Gospel Coalition realm. I spent a couple years under Tim Keller. I know that the world knows me as a charismaniac, but um, I've got that other deep theological side of me. And uh, and I learned something from him. What What he did in the analog world is Tim Keller would meet with one person from his congregation every single week through the entirety of his career as a lead pastor. And he would say, what did you learn from Sunday sermon? What stood out to you? What did you like? What did you not like? What didn't connect with you? And he would do this over a breakfast or a lunch every single week. And he would have that meeting with entrepreneurs. He would have that meeting with stay at home moms and, you know, to have that meet. And he would do that because he was collecting data. And so pastors who are like, I don't have time to make social clips out of my preaching probably don't care about the craft of preaching as much as they say they do. Because preaching is both a gift and it's a craft. 
You know, the thing about it is it's like study to show yourself approved. There's yes, there's the anointing. Yes, there's Peter standing up in front of the multitudes in the book of Acts and under the unction of the Holy Spirit delivering a message. But then there's also like, you know, there's the craft of preaching. There's Jesus as a child in the temple, you know, the honing and being, you know, like exercising that gift. And so for me as a preacher, I solicit feedback. So I guess the first thing I would say is if you don't like feedback, you're going to hate being an internet personality because the comment section is going to tell you how stupid you are. They're going to tell you how, how you don't understand the Bible. They're going to tell you like, you know, that the way you're dressed. So like, if you don't like feedback, you're, you're not made, you're, you could just turn the podcast off right now. But for me, <laughs> I have a level, I try to have a level of humility to say, are they right? Like, I'll give you an example. Cause then I'm, I'm going to definitively answer your question in a second, but there was a Instagram page that featured a preaching clip of mine and, and they just roasted me and they, and the, all the comments were like, this is word salad. This guy has no idea what he's talking about. The truth is they were right. I remember I was preaching at a huge conference. I got to this port, this one portion of my sermon where I did lose control. It was kind of like, I don't know what I'm saying right now. You know, like I, how do I get to this next point, which anybody who's ever preached in front of a, an audience knows what that feels like. The problem is my team somebody saw value in what I was saying and the way they edited it and whatever it, they thought it was going to perform well, but enough people were like, this is word salad. This guy's just making this crap up, which the truth is in that moment I was. And so I, so now I'm getting roasted on this Instagram channel, but I thought it was hilarious because I'm like, you're right. You know, I, I am in that moment of my sermon was, I was full on idiot mode. So my point in saying that is like, you have like to go into the internet. It's like, yeah, they're going to tell you the way you're dressed is, you know, tacky and they're going to be right. Sometimes they're going to tell you, you need to lose weight and they're right. Sometimes they're going to tell you, you don't know what you're talking about and they're right. Sometimes. And what the world doesn't need is another perfect pastor. It needs one who's like, yeah, you got me. And I remember jumping in the comment section and be like, actually, my team put this 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 uh, section up. I totally was at a loss. I, I was struggling through that. Like, hey, everybody. And, and then the comments turned in my favor. And everyone's like, that's so awesome that he's here admitting to it. So it's kind of like just, like, just like Tim Keller would bring people into lunches and be like, hey, tell me what you didn't like about my sermon. I think there's this part of this internet where it doesn't diminish my authority as a preacher and a man of God to have a comment section. It's just what I was used to because I've been preaching since the 90s is nobody being able to give me feedback because they listen when I talk and I've had to open my heart to that. So to, to answer your question like definitively, I think it just comes down to if you picked volunteers and said, hey, would you listen to my sermon? And, and it only is going to take you 30 minutes to an hour, but then in your notepad on your phone, write some timestamps to some moments that really affected you. You could actually have a volunteer staff of every demographic that would give you your timestamps. And then all you need to do is have a basic editor just cut those out and post them online. And then there's so many tools nowadays that you drag your sermon in and it does it for you. It captions it for you. It puts it in nine by 16 for the format. It's like literally your, your elementary school age kid in fifth grade could use the technology nowadays. But if you're like, I don't know what the, the clips are, I would say, don't even find them yourself. Have people from your church volunteer to find them and they'll do it for free for you because they, you're their pastor and like, oh yeah, I'll listen to the sermon and it's a double win. So those are the kinds of things I actually do. Hey, so-and-so who's at our Indiana campus, who's a single woman, would you listen to the sermon this week? Give me a couple moments that stood out for you. I take those time timestamps, send them to the person on staff who edits. I'm like, hey, make some clips out of this. And then it goes viral. And then all the single women are in the comments like, this helped me so much because I found a representative from her tribe. I love that. I love that. I always encourage pastors to to have their team look for clippable moments because typically if you wrote the sermon, points that stick out to you aren't necessarily points that stick out to other people. I remember yeah. whenever I was a youth pastor, I preached this one message and you've probably been there before where you're like, man, that was just dog crap. Like that was not my <laughs> best work. Like I, I, I got done. Yeah. I was like, man, that was rough. And then I had this, uh, this like 16 year old boy come up to me. He's like, Brady, that 
was probably the best message you've ever and he started like calling things back that from my message and i was like man i need to i need to help so so that being said what you think from your message might be like the best for social media might not be what other people need to hear so i love the the practical advice having people from your team listen to the message and intentionally mark points in the sermon that are clippable moments. Now, one of the things I recommend, just practical tips for, uh, and then you can send this portion of the podcast to your editor, is you want the very like first three seconds of that clip to be something that's going to get someone to stop scrolling, right? So uh, you would call that your hook of the video. And so I'll encourage our editors to, it's okay to kind of rearrange the what I say when I say it or what the pastor says when he says it if it makes sense for a 30 to 60 second clip on social media to put that hookable or that the, the hook moment at the very front. And so that's just some practicals for uh, people listening right now. Now, Pastor Mike, you guys have built a, a pretty big following online across your Instagram and YouTube and things. So what do you think is the uh, just the easiest thing that people can do? Like, wh- what do you think is like the secret sauce that has led to your growth online? Yeah, I think whenever you, when, for, for those of you who are like, I want to grow, growth is actually very hard. It's it's easy to get views. It's a lot harder to get followers because to, to have somebody click that button to say, I'm making a choice to, to follow this church or follow this pastor is very hard. I, I mean, I'm going to say that, but... A lot of it is that, you know, you, you know, this, there's that scripture, you have not because you ask not. Like something very simple is actually putting at the end of your content a call to action, whether it's in text or verbal, you know, tap the follow button. Because most human beings do not organically think to follow people. And so when we just started asking, I know that's super practical, not supernatural, but just like Jesus said, come follow me. That was a call to action. He, he didn't, they, like Peter didn't come up with that idea. He wasn't like, I'm going to follow this guy. It was actually Jesus saying, you come follow me. And then they said yes or no. They had to make a decision. So for us, it's like, if you want to be discipled by my digital platforms, I'm going to ask you to follow me. That's up to you whether or not you do. And so I think the, the biggest thing is, is, is actually ask people, the other thing too is you got to ask yourself like what does my content do? Do I educate? Do I entertain? I, I have a few friends that their um, persona on YouTube Shorts and Instagram Reels is entertainment. It's Christian humor, and I love that because I don't have that gift at all. So they do like short skits and stuff like that, and they go viral like on a daily basis. But what they don't, it's almost like if they made a a teaching video, it would be so left of center. Their audience would be like, what are you doing? What they do is like Christian satire or Christian humor or whatever. And that's how they amass their followers because their vision and their mission is aligned. So I do think you have to determine like, what are you? So for me, I'm a Bible teacher and that's why I've been successful. I teach the Bible and I answer questions that a lot of pastors won't touch. So for example, uh, you know, I just recently had a, a renowned astrophysicist on my YouTube channel, and he's a, he's a legitimate astrophysicist. And we talked about aliens and UFOs, and we talked about all this crazy science stuff. Well, you know, it's very difficult to find out how to interject that into the conversation in your local church. But but that's what normal humans are like. Yeah, what are aliens? Do you know? And so I brought an authoritative voice on, and me and an astrophysicist talk science. So what I love about social media is that you, if you narrow down your niche, like what am I, what am I going to do, whether it's repurposing my sermon clips, like for example, you could mash clips up. You could be like, I talked about this on Sunday, and then I'm going to mash it with a clip of an astrophysicist, or I'm going to mash it with a clip of the news. You know, there's so many ways creatively to extend out the conversation from Sundays. So for me, I don't do satire. I don't do humor. Um, I don't do emotion like like I'm not a uh, you know like necessarily and I have emotional moments and stuff I do a portion of my stuff as demonstration of the gifts of the spirit but but like my main driver is teaching the scriptures so that's why people follow me they're like oh I can't find a pastor that that will talk about this topic but this guy does and he's not 
necessarily uh, sensationalizing it. He's trying to give a rational, objective lesson for it, and I'm going to follow him for that, you know? And so I think, have I done, I've done funny stuff to widen people's perspective of me, but I don't do that constantly. I've done emotional stuff and shown the gifts of the spirit, but I also don't want to be known as a clickbait. I've talked about controversial stuff, but I don't want to be known as, um, uh, what would you call that? Like, um, uh, somebody that's provocative. I don't want to be provocative. I'm not Howard Stern, you know, but I do know there are people who build big platforms off of being provocative. And anytime something happens in the news, they speak to it. I don't want to be that guy, but I feel like as a Bible teacher, every once in a while, I can speak into something that's provocative by, by nature because I'm teaching the Bible or every once in a while I can be funny because I'm a human being. Every once in a while, but I have my main driver. And I think a lot of people struggle because they don't have a vision and a mission. So just like if you're a pastor listening to this right now, if your church has a vision and a mission, if you learned how to dial that and you're actually being successful as a local church, if you can figure out how to transpose vision and mission and dial that into a social media, you can be successful online. I love it, bro. I love it. Uh, one of the things that I know about V1 is you guys have utilized social media in a really interesting way that has led to a, a super unique way in how you guys structure your campuses and everything across the country and across the world. So I'd love for you to speak to that because I think it's super interesting when you first told me about it and it's super unique. So why don't you go ahead and tell the listeners about what you guys have going on with that? But before we do that, River wanted to tell you about my book, The Plan Your Visit Playbook. You can actually get it for free at planyourvisitplaybook.com. This book will walk you through step-by-step how you can actually get new guests coming to your church every single Sunday using the Plan Your Visit strategy. We'll put a link in the description, and you can go to planyourvisitplaybook.com to get your free copy. Now, back to the episode. Yeah, I mean, listen, if you read you know, the, the gospels all the way through to the book of revelation. And you try to get in touch with like a new, new Testament, new covenant context for church. And you try to actually wrap your head around what, what does this look like in practicality? We have the epistles, we have the administration of gifting, we have the mention of pastor, but we also have the mention of apostle, prophet, teacher, and evangelist. And, and what does that look like? You know, I found it, and I'm just saying this, Brady, I'm just saying this. I found it very interesting that when I sat under Tim Keller, who's a Presbyterian, they talked about apest. And so even the reform community is embracing the concept of apostle, uh, you know, apest is like apostle, prophet, you know, teacher, evangelist, uh, and, and so pastor. And then the, now the Charismatics and Pentecostals for years, people call themselves apostle so-and-so, prophet so-and-so. And I think they've been made fun of to a certain degree, and, they've, and that's been diminished. And you had this seeker-sensitive model. I'm friends with Chris Hodges. I, I taught for Highlands College. You guys can watch it on YouTube. It was an awesome time with them. And so I, I kind of consider myself trans-denominational. Um, I'm not non-denominational because I've learned to embrace aspects from many traditions that um, I believe are transcendent, and we shouldn't have thrown them all out. And so I, I, it's just like I say all that to say that the seeker-sensitive model of the non-denominational church, I think we are moving beyond that now. And, and I think that you're going to see, and this is more me speaking prophetically, you're going to see more right now, horoscopes, the new age, you know, our Gen Z, you know, go, go on TikTok and type in the hashtag witch talk, you know, tarot card readings are happening through live streams now, both on YouTube and Instagram and, and TikTok. So go into your local grocery store. You're not going to find a Bible, but in that same magazine section, you're going to find spellbinding books and things like that. So we live in a society that is not increasingly atheistic. It's increasingly spiritual, spiritual, but not religious. So people believe in the supernatural. Right now we have a movie. I'm getting today I'm gonna, I'm interviewing the directors from a movie called Nefarious. And and so it's all about exorcism. Then one of the it constantly is the number one podcast in the nation. I interviewed another guy, um, The Exorcist Files. People are curious about the supernatural. Come out in Jesus' name, hit uh, the top five in the box office competing against major movies twice already. People are curious about the supernatural. The problem is most of our churches give us a coloring book version of the Bible, you know, where it's like, 
we're trying to make something supernatural very palatable. When the supernatural is not palatable, that's why people crave it, right? So I said all that to say our church has basically said, what does the first century church look like? And if we could bring back first century church leaders, how would what would they birth in the earth? Because a lot of what I see in the kingdom, Brady, is copycatting. And so it's like, so-and-so is successful, so let me copycat. And my thing is like, isn't it weird that we're not copycatting first century apostolic leadership, but we are copycatting somebody else's bread? Like, and then the thing I love about New York City is I, I, I had both my hands tied behind my back because I tried to do seeker-sensitive church in this region, and it didn't work. So I was like, okay, I got to go back. And so long story short, what we focused on is becoming not a church planning movement, but a disciple making movement because we know we're called to make disciples that make disciples. So I started my church with 18 people and said, if I could actually teach 18 people to make a disciple, like 18 people who preach the gospel to their friends, their family members, their coworkers unapologetically and who understand, and then, you know, cause right now we have this big political thing and it's like, listen, don't hide the cross underneath the flag. So it's like before you're an American, you're you're a Christian. Don't go to your job and you're afraid to tell people about Jesus, but because before you're a carpenter, before you're a plumber, before you're a construction worker, you are a Christian. And so it's like if you and so it's like stop. So I was like if I could teach 18 people how to be a a, a real Christian, and then part of that means if you're going to call yourself a Christian and you've never led anybody to Christ, you're not a Christian. Because I've read the, the New Testament. And so it's like, you, you, it's, it's impossible. It, it re, and it really means like, if you're not excited to tell people the gospel, it's because you've received a false gospel. And it, because, you know, the, the, you know we, we, in our churches, we have the, the um, sinner's prayer. You know, it's like, raise your hand if you want to confess Christ. Confession is, just makes you an honest sinner. Yeah, you got me. I'm confess Like, repentance is like, a true gospel conversion, you know? It's like, I'm renouncing this. And then in most churches in America, the pastor's saying things like, oh, there's no perfect person allowed, which actually isn't in the Bible. Jesus said, if you sin and you can't stop sinning, cut your hand off so the rest of your body doesn't go into the fire. And so most of our churches have support groups for sin instead of a call to salvation, where it's like, no, man. And now, obviously Jesus wasn't saying literally cut your hand off. What he was trying to say is, and he said it in another point, go and sin no more. Where, where is that message in our churches in America? Go and sin no more. Like the expectation was don't do it again ever for the rest of your life. And I feel like for us, it's like we became so soft in America that we are telling people, oh, I struggle too. No, as your pastor, I don't struggle. <laughs> like I don't struggle with lust and perversion. I don't struggle with financial impropriety. I don't struggle. And look at how many pastors are cheating and losing their whole ministries because we've created a culture around the false gospel. So, the, so to give you the real answer, actually preach the Bible unapologetically bring people to a full understanding of the real Jesus and the real gospel, then teach them that their obligation is to go lead other people to Christ, not bring them to church, but bring them to Christ. And when you do that, and this is what we did, Muslims, atheists, agnostics, Hindus, lukewarm Christians will all literally ignite into real believers who start ruthlessly preaching the gospel and leading people. And then guess what? They won't care that they're a construction worker. They won't care that they're not on the payroll of the church. They will be so consumed with the gospel that they will they, their life will take on new meaning. And then we hit fastest growing church in America four, four years in a row. <laughs> so it's like, and I, and I know that's a long answer, but then we had to put structure to life, not putting life to structure. So everybody's like, teach me the structure. What do you need it for? Yeah, you can't, it's like, I don't, you don't, so, so for me, bring life. So that was what I just told you. That's part one. Then once you have explosive life, like resurrection power, then put structure to that. That was the New Testament. The New Testament is, wait, wait, wait a second. I came there, I preached the gospel. And since I left, you guys have gotten involved in all this sin. Let me teach you how to structure it. And what the seeker sensitive movement did, it was, it gave us structure without life. And it was like, let's hope that God blesses this. Let's hope that God cares about what we're doing. 
I'm saying let's get back to what the, what we're supposed to be doing, and then if that actually necessitates it, we'll put structure to it. So what we have is three layers. We have revival homes, we have hubs, and then we have campuses. So revival homes are, hey, you can't find – a, an authentic life-giving church in your area, just watch us on the live stream and then formalize that and we'll call it a revival home and then we'll administrate it with our pastors and our leaders and we'll give you legitimate accountability and oversight. And then the next phase is, man, if you outgrow that home and now it's like, we don't fit in the home anymore, Pastor Mike, what do we do? Praise God, then we're gonna graduate to a hub where you're still watching the live stream, but you're doing it in a like Hawaii, we have an entire college gymnasium filled up in Hawaii, uh, and it's a hub right now. In Toronto, we have a live stream on a big screen, and in Toronto, they're watching, and this whole hotel is filled up. Um, and, and so that's kind of like our hubs. Then the next and final stage is like, man, you guys have been faithful in the home phase. You were faithful in the hub phase, and now we're going to graduate you to a campus with a campus pastor and more of a traditional American, what you would see. But the thing is, we honor each phase because when you read Acts, um, when you read Acts chapter two and you go all the way down, it's like they, the, they said the apostles went from house to house. So they had these large inspirational gatherings, but they also had these home iterations. So we kind of like are we're we are like just as much a home church movement as we are a campus church movement. But at, the, but at the base of it is all just radical discipleship. So I think if anybody's listening right now, the, it's like, and I hope I'm sparking something in pastors because it's like the superficiality of it is the internet, digital. But for me, it's like Paul wrote letters, and and I'm not and I'm not trying to elevate your live stream to the level of like apostolic epistles. But what I am saying is, a message had to get to people. The excuse was I'm not geographically there, and the solution was here's a piece of paper. My thing is I can't physically get to Hawaii. I'm in New York City, but my barrier breaker is the live stream, and 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 that becomes like, hey, I can still minister to you, and then and then I so I but I also would say last thing, Brady, because I know I went on for like 20 minutes, is if you're not called to apostolic leadership, maybe this isn't for you, and maybe you just say, okay, what's my version of this? It's just simply me faithfully teaching the word, but then I'm going to engage my own local church people. For, you know, instead of them only seeing their pastor once a month, because that's only how much people, people attend church one to 1.5 times a month, they're going to see me in their news feeds, you know, seven to 12 times a month. And you're just increasing that dosage, which means you're discipling them a little bit more than you used to. And you still haven't caught up to the other nine hours a day that they're on their phone being discipled by all this demonic infrastructure, but at least you're competing, you know? So I think it's on both ends of the spectrum. Somebody probably heard everything I just said, and they're going to birth this multinational apostolic vision, but then someone else just heard what I said, and they're going to become a much better local pastor. I love it, man. God's doing amazing things through your ministry in V1. Uh, one of the things that I hear from pastors all the time is like, likes are great. Views are great. Awesome. I'm so glad that uh, people are being discipled just from my 60 second clips online, but I, I've got a lot of empty seats on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> I, we've got other needs in the church. And so how do you recommend churches actually turn views online to butts and seats? Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm going to say something to answer that question. It's going to be a quick answer because I know I just went on a tirade for the last one. But, you know, I'm going to give a, an answer nobody wants to hear. But it's the God honest truth, okay? If people, if, if, if they see something substantial, if there's an authentic anointing, with it, which is the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of God on your preaching— if, and they encounter that, you don't even have to tell them to come. They will find it on their own. It's just like a restaurant. Like, I don't, I don't know how many uh, advertisements for restaurants you're exposed to, but I will tell you, like, there's something about that actionable step. Like, if it's real, I, and, and I know this is probably not the answer people want, but it's just like they seek us out. They type in their browser, v1.church, because they see something that, 
that affects change in their life. And it's, so it's like, I think that would be the thing I'm wrestling with. It's like, if there's empty seats, it's like, I think you need to retool your leadership because you might have the wrong wine skin for this era. Your leadership structure of your church might be the right plan for the wrong era. Like what you were doing would, would have made you the most successful church in the 90s or the 2010s or the 2020s. But there has been a seismic shift in what people want and how we should be structured from 2020 on. And so I think that's retool your leadership. Um, that's why we're doing a big leaders. We're actually doing a pastor's conference this fall at our Indiana campus just to meet the need of pastors asking me, how do I do that? But then I think the other side of it is if there's not oil on your preaching, pastor, f start fasting, start, get down on your knees pray. Everybody's like, what's your trick to going viral? Yes, you have a hook, but I've taught people formulas and I've given them like my own editors and their content did not move on the internet because there's not a grace on it because, the, and here's the other thing, what's your motive for this? Like, like, I think if you want people in the seat to build an audience, the Lord will cancel that motive, but I don't want an audience. I want an army. So it's like there's there's circles, like every leader has a circle around them. The question is, is the circle facing inward or outward? So like if you're the leader in the middle, are all the leaders facing you? Are all the circle around you, the, the people facing you? Like I want, or are they facing outward saying, I want to hear what this guy says so that I can now face outward into the world and go do what he's teaching me to do. And I think if you have all these empty seats and your motive is like, how do I get a bigger audience? The Lord's like, why am I going to help you with that? But if, you're, if your motive is, God, we need to change our city. God, we need to change our secular environments. I, we can't home, all these parents can't homeschool all these kids. We got to send them into a school um, in a secular environment. And we need Daniel chapter five and Daniel chapter three to happen in the public school system. And I've got to raise up an army and these parents need to be equipped. Lord, how do we get these construction workers and blue collar guys to push aside their plate and they're starving to death at work and they're, and they're building things, but they're saying like, you know, they're, they're saying, God, your kingdom come here on this job site. If, if, you're, if your motive is to build an audience, I'm telling you the Lord, there's no oil on that. But for me, I never wanted a big church. I wanted, see, I think churches are measured by the world and they're weighed by God. So it's like the world says, what's your number? Oh, 2,000 people. Oh, dang, your church is big. And the Lord's like, yeah, but you're weightless. And then I think there's other churches that are 200, 300, 400, 500, and they weigh a lot because they're affecting change. There was only four in Babylon, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The number was not great, but the weight in Babylonian in, in that Babylonian empire was massive because it shifted the whole atmosphere. And they said, Nebuchadnezzar said, we can't even worship this image anymore. We have to worship the God of these three Hebrew boys. And so it's like, I would question the pastor, like, what do you weigh? Not what do you measure the church? Because we're, we're hitting crazy numbers, dude. I mean, the week after Easter for us was bigger than Easter <laughs> by over a thousand people. So all that tells me is whatever I did on Easter hit so hard and it weighed so much that they were like, bro, you got to come back to this church. And most pastors, lead pastors go on vacation after Easter, so it's like, I'm just trying to mess with people's paradigm because they get comfortable, they get mediocre. And so I think like, it's like the anointing, if the anointing is on what you're doing, it will go viral. Dude, last thing I'll say to this question, the Lord gave me like a word for the kingdom the other day. And I, you know, I'm sitting in a studio right now. If you guys are listening on audio, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's like $70,000 studio I'm in right now with a professional audio, multi-cam. I got Sony FX3s, cinematic cameras, and I do all this stuff. And those things get views. This is a passion of mine. I grabbed my cell phone last week. It's just a regular iPhone. It's not even the new one. And with the front-facing camera and 720 or whatever it was, I went live on Facebook and YouTube, and it went viral. And I just gave the word that the Lord gave me. That was it. I just said what the Lord told me to say for like 15 minutes, and I ended the live. And it's got 100,000 views on Facebook. It's approaching 100,000 on YouTube right now. That's 200,000 cumulative views with no production. 
but it was anointed. And so I, I think like going back to that aspect of like, I think that in my life, there's a convergence of old meets new. It's like a hybrid seed. First century meets 21st century. Are we fasting like the first century? Are we being crucified like the first century? Are we radically generous like the first century? Are we really doing the work? Are we preaching in the streets like Paul was in the streets all the way to the Areopagus, which was their stadium, like from the streets to the stadium? Like, and then are we marrying that with 21st century technology? And if you can, dude, It'll, I mean, and, and I think if somebody's listening right now and the passion for ministry is gone, it's because you're doing it the wrong way. Because I am so full of passion, dude. I, I walk the streets of New York City ministering the gospel and I, get, I mainly get rejected and it feels so good to suffer for the gospel. That keeps me humble. I never want to be the guy that preaches three times on a Sunday, but zero times on Monday through Thursday. So I think for me, it's like I'm just living in this immersive world of, am I preaching the gospel to the guy in the deli down the street from me in New York City? And he's telling me, bro, shut up. I don't want to hear this. Leave me alone. I just came for a sandwich. And I walk out saying, okay, I sowed the seed. That was my job. And then Sunday, I got a big keyboard behind me and a massive sound system, and I'm preaching, but it keeps me balanced. And I think a lot of pastors, Brady, nowadays are just straight up denominational hirelings, and they need to quit their job and actually start their ministry. I love it, bro. I love it. So good. So good. Well, look, uh, before we wrap up, did you have anything you want to plug? I think this was probably one of our best podcast interviews that we've done. You've brought so much value. So uh, anything you wanted to plug, man, before we wrap up? Yeah. you. Partly the reason why I went in so hard is because I'm trying to break through the perception of, oh, Mike Signorelli just, um, you know, he knows how to edit really well or he understands the internet because like they don't understand. I'm I'm like an old school person in a new school context and I'm just – and I'm and so I never want people to replicate my camera quality. That's the wrong like you know what I mean? People are like, yeah, that's the wrong thing. It's like I it's like because I'm telling you it does that is not the metric. Or I don't want them to think that I have this massive team. Matter of fact, me and my peers, like other guys like me, because I'm just one of many guys doing this right now, you would be surprised to discover they have like one editor. It's like they don't have these massive team. Matter of fact, what you'll also be surprised to discover is that sometimes uh, when they, they, they end up editing stuff their own self and they just teach it to themselves and these guys are 50 years old. So it's like because they're like, I know what the Lord wants me to do. So I think it's just like trying to demolish a lot of those excuses. I, I would say for um, anybody, like what I want to plug right now would be um, if, you, if you go to MikeSignorelli.com, or if you go to my YouTube channel, subscribe. But I have a lot of resources, um, it, you know, on that on that end. I, and I think uh, I haven't posted about it yet. But the pastors' conference we're doing in the fall hasn't even gone live yet for registrations because we're locking in the remaining dates. But it'll definitely be in the fall. But yeah, I would say just find me at mikesignorelli.com and kind of engage with my stuff and and follow me there. And um, I think that's the safest <laughs> the safest way to engage with me. So. Um, but I'm excited to teach this stuff, too, because, like, my origin story, I, I have a movie that's coming out this October across 2,000 theaters in the United States, and it's going to kind of tell the narrative behind this. It really was my wife. Just she, a lot of the stuff I said in this setting that sounded so brutal was literally my wife saying it to me. And that, my wife was like, Mike, when you're with people in the room, they get freedom. They, they get breakthrough. They understand the word of God. Just do that on your phone. And it was my wife just begging me to do that. So I think like now that I've clicked in, I'm kind of carrying that and um, paying it forward. So hopefully for people, they were encouraged and empowered, even if it came off like a rebuke, not discouraged, you know, um, because I'm telling you guys, and I can't say this enough, it really is like a lot of the people going viral, it's the wrong people. And I'll, I'll say this, Brady, real quick, this last thing. I have a lot of guys reaching out to me now who are like, hey, will you mentor me? Will you teach me? And they are the guys who are going viral. And I'm like, why would you, you know, want me? You have 3 million, you know, followers. And, they're like, and they tell me, we don't, I don't really even know the word. I'm just regurgitating stuff I see online. And I don't even have wow. a real spiritual life. So I think there's a lot of people listening. Now, I felt like a weight on this broadcast 
there's a lot of people listening that are like, you know, oh, the internet's not for me. And I just can't impress on them enough. No, it actually is. Like, we need your voice, a real authentic voice, more than all these phonies. And it's just because they they tried and you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well, guys, go check out everything that Pastor Mike is doing. Pastor Mike, thanks so much for hopping on. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next Church Candy episode. Man, what an incredible conversation with Pastor Mike from V1 Church. Before we wrap up, I do want to invite you to get this book that River here is checking out, The Plan Your Visit Playbook. You can get it for free at planyourvisitplaybook.com. Be sure to check out Pastor Mike everywhere he is on the socials and everything he's got going on. And please remember to like and subscribe on YouTube, as well as follow us on iTunes and Spotify and leave us a review. It would mean a lot. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you on the next episode. You say, let's go. Can you say, thank you. Can you look right there and say, bye-bye. Bye-bye.